Uh, my name is David Goodman. I'm the director of the China Studies Center. I'm going to hand over in a minute to um, um, uh, Josh Stenberg, who's, the, who's from the Department of China Studies. This activity is a, um, a joint activity between the Department of Chinese Studies and the China Studies Center. Before we begin uh, this meeting, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognize their con continuing connection to land, water, and culture. I'm currently on the land of the uh, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, their past, present, and emerging elders. I further uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are on, and uh, pay respects to their elders, past, present, and future. And now over to Josh. Great, thank you very much uh, for that welcome, uh, David. I'm Josh Denberg from the Department of Chinese Studies at the University of Sydney. Um, this is a part of a series of lectures that the uh, China Studies Center and the department um, have organized. We're very glad today to welcome Professor Paul Gladstone, who's the inaugural Judith Nielsen Chair, Professor of Contemporary Art at the University of New South Wales, also in uh, Sydney, a crosstown uh, neighbor. Um, he, uh, he was previously Professor of Contemporary Visual Cultures and Critical Theory at the University of Nottingham, and prior to that, Associate Professor at the University of Nottingham and inaugural head of the School of International communications at the University of Nottingham, Ningbo. Um, he has published uh, very widely on uh, concerns of critical and cultural theory as regarding uh, China and often particularly Chinese art. Uh, the talk will be something like 40 to 45 minutes and then Professor Gladstone will be available for a question and answer session um, at the end. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today and thank you very much to Professor Gladstone for sharing his recent research. Many thanks. Uh, thank you to David and to Josh um, and to Yan Ping for inviting me to speak today. It's a, it's a great pleasure and uh, hopefully my, what I have to say will be of interest. It, it, what I'm going to say isn't taken directly from uh, the new book that I've co-edited, which I think we, we kind of made reference to on the blurb for the talk, um, but the book, which is about visual culture wars at the borders of contemporary China, does relate to some extent um, to what I have to say. I should just warn uh, listeners that, um, as ever, the internet Connections are a bit flaky. So if I do drop out, it should be momentary and I'll just carry on with uh, what I have to say uh, over across the break, uh, across any breaks. And if um, we have the chance, we'll obviously edit out the breaks in any recording. Anyway, so pushing the boundaries, intersections between China's current national self image, Tian Xia, all under heaven, and the traces of Confucian aesthetics. In recent years, the People's Republic of China has become increasingly assertive in the upholding of its sovereign national territorial limits. This assertiveness extends to numerous locations bordering mainland China, including the South China Sea, an area now subject to heightened tensions between the PRC and other coastal nation states regarding territorial and maritime controls and rights of way. The Republic of China, Taiwan, since 1949, a self-governing island state, recognizes the inheritive dynastic imperial China under international law, which Beijing considers a province integral to the PRC. The Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, whose government and economy were guaranteed a degree of autonomy for 50 years after the region's handover to the PRC from British rule in 1997, under the principle of one country, two systems, but which are now subject to increasing control by Beijing. And the line of actual control between the PRC and India at Ladakh, uncertainties over which have resulted in persistent conflict involving actual or perceived incursions over the line by the militaries of both sides. The PRC's territorial assertiveness in each of these cases can be readily explained in socio-economic and political terms. 
during the so-called century of shame from the second half of the 19th century, an economically, technologically and governmentally weakened China found itself unable to successfully resist European, Japanese and US colonialist imperialist ambitions in Southeast and East Asia. From the early 20th century until the founding of communist New China in 1949, the Chinese state was also riven by protracted civil conflicts. Since the introduction of post-revolutionary reforms at the beginning of the 1980s, and the onset of neoliberal globalization at the end of the decade, the PRC's economy has grown exponentially, becoming second only to the US in terms of GDP. Growing economic power and influence has given the PRC increased confidence on the world stage. It has also enabled the PRC to build the regional dominance and international reach of its military. The PRC's island building in the South China Sea can, for example, therefore be understood as a means of protecting the country's vital economic interests. 80% of the PRC's energy import and 39.5% of its total trade passes through the South China Sea, as well as asserting sovereign ownership over valuable fishing rights and identified fossil fuel deposits albeit in ways viewed by competing states as militarily enabled force majeure. The PRC's recent exponential domestic economic growth has been accompanied by an increasingly ardent nationalism within mainland China, promoted by the Chinese government as a focus for social coherence at a time of destabilizing post-revolutionary reforms and as a closing of ranks against outside interference in the PRC's domestic affairs. The PRC's increasingly ardent nationalism is strongly informed by a desire to re-establish a historically unified greater China, divided by the combined violence of colonialism, imperialism, and civil conflict. In a recent speech commemorating the century of the Communist Party, President Xi Jinping asserted that the era of China being bullied by others is over. The PRC's territorial assertions regarding the South China Sea, the Hong Kong SAR, Taiwan, and territories bordering India at Ladakh are from that perspective simply rightful projections of a pre-existing sovereignty. I, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, we're getting various messages that people aren't able to see the screen share. Well, it says I'm screen sharing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think people can see has started screen sharing, but then can't see the um, actual well that that will be down to my internet connection i'm afraid there's nothing i can do okay sorry okay sorry about that less immediately obvious perhaps are intersections between the present day prc's assertive upholding of its sovereign national territorial limits and china's dynastic imperial cultural traditions the ideas of national sovereignty self-determination and non-interference between nation states upon which the current rules-based international order is founded are relatively recent in origin. Some scholars have traced their emergence to two related treaties known as the Peace of Westphalia, which brought the Thirty Years' War and the Eighty Years' War in Europe to a close in 1648. Since the 17th century, the construction of autonomous nation states with determined geographical boundaries has spread worldwide in no small part through the metastasizing of Euro-American colonialism imperialism and the accompanying impact of westernized modernity. China did not become, a, become recognized as a nation state fully until the collapse of its last imperial dynasty, the Qing, in 1912 and the founding of modern Republican China in that year. Prior to that, China was an empire whose reach extended without determinate territorial limits to a constellation of surrounding suzerainities and culturally Chinese diasporic communities. The sovereignty of the Chinese dynastic imperial state was underpinned by the unifying concept of Tianxia, all under heaven, first fully developed during China's Zhou dynasty, 1046 to 256 BCE. Tianxia signifies all the lands under the jurisdiction of the Chinese emperor which in principle encompasses the globe. It also conceives of a concentric geopolitical order with Chinese civilization closest to imperial power at the center of the world and differing levels of influence radi radiating out to non-Chinese speaking barbarians at the periphery. In practice, imperial China's immediate outward facing frontiers were subject to continual disruption like those of Republican China because of invasion and civil conflict. 
The first use of the Mandarin term Zhongguo, Middle Kingdom, signifying the centrality of the Chinese imperial state to the world, can be traced back to the 11th century, but was not established officially until the 17th century. It appears officially for the first time in the Sino-Russian Treaty of Nerchinsk, signed in 1689. The term Zhongguo has been used ever since as a short form name for the Chinese state in both its dynastic imperial and later Republican forms. Tianxia's geopolitical vision contrasts with third space post-colonialist and decolonialist conceptions of empire and nationhood where distinctions between center and periphery have been pervasively deconstructed toward the prospect of a necessarily loosely defined global cosmopolitanism. Historically, Tianxia was closely enmeshed with pragmatic idealist Chinese Confucian conceptions of social order, morality, and aesthetics. China's dynastic imperial administrative class, known outside China as the literati, upheld an idealizing and morally driven exoteric Confucian vision of a harmonious, hierarchically ordered society under imperial rule. That idealizing vision intersected from its interception, inception during the fifth century BCE, with immemorial esoteric conceptions of a non-rationalist reciprocity between individuals and between humanity and heaven in spontaneous accordance with the way of nature, as set out in the fourth century Taoist classic, the Tao Te Ching. Unlike the ostensibly similar counter-foundational Deridian conception of difference, Taoist inflected Confucianism's conception of a cosmological state of reciprocity, as signified by the now internationally recognized yin yang symbol, points ultimately towards non-rationalist relations of difference as the very condition of metaphysical totality. In addition to administering the Chinese dynastic imperial state, the literati were expected to show their adeptness at a range of arts, including the so-called three perfections of poetry, poetry writing, calligraphy, and painting. The ability to depict landscapes through ink and brush painting on silk and paper in aesthetically resonant ways was, for example, considered indicative of the literati's capacity to administer the Chinese dynastic imperial state, long harmonizing Taoist inflected Confucian lines. Hopefully at least some of you can see that next slide that's gone through. Including an ethical imperative to resist overweening authority deleterious to the stability and continuity of the Chinese dynastic imperial state, albeit understandably in often oblique ways. Imperial authority and Confucian morality and aesthetics thus became intimately conjoined in the imperial Chinese cultural imagination. Crucial to an understanding of Confucian literati artistic practices, is the idea of Qian Shandong, vital energy resonance. Described in the preface to her Sears, the record of classification of old painters, circa 550, as one of six points to consider when judging a painting, which has long since been considered the ruling desideratum of Chinese painting and poetry. Qian Shandong is understood to connect nature, artists, artworks, and viewers, as well as readers through a virtuous web of empathetically shared feeling, commensurate with Taoism's conception of cosmological harmony and Confucian aspirations towards social order and good governance. It is also associated with a range of other concepts, including shu shu, emptiness, substance. The idea that conjunctions of form and absences of form have the capacity to amplify diverse meanings and feelings. Unlike the contrasting conceptions of beauty, feelings of pleasure, and sublimity, feelings of pain pleasure, identified by 18th century European aesthetics, Qian Shindong signifies a more complex, subjectively nuanced, and unfolding array of potential artistic affects. The aesthetics and formal organization of Confucian literati landscape paintings which in numerous cases present highly aestheticized formal abstractions while representing, as the contemporary photographer Michael Cherney has demonstrated, topographical realities, can thus be interpreted as a correlative to the equally indeterminate non-rationalist rationalizing conception of Tianxia. In his early fifth century text, Preface on Landscape Painting, the artist and musician Zhongbing comments, 
and rolling paintings in solitude, I sit pondering the ends of the earth. Tsong asserts in the same text that landscapes have a material existence and yet also reach in a spiritual domain. The sophisticated complexity of meaning and feeling signified by Qian Shandong diverges from the orientalizing projection of a supposedly sublime, irrational and stand pat Chinese culture within the context of westernized post enlightenment philosophical aesthetics by the likes of Immanuel Kant and GWF Hegel. Recently, Tianxia has made a comeback as part of Chinese intellectual life. The contemporary Chinese scholar Zhao Tingyang has, for example, argued for Tianxia's instatement or reinstatement as a form of global governance or a basis for global governance based in or rooted on the reciprocal coexistence of different societies, replacing the existing Western, westernized world order of competing nation states. It is important to note in this regard that government supported nationalism within the PRC since the 1990s has been informed by an official rededication to Confucian ideas of social harmony. Seen from that standpoint, the intersection of the PRC as a modern nation state and Tianxia's non-rationalist rationalizing conception of concentric sovereignty can be understood to underwrite the country's integrity and its projection on the world stage beyond defined territorial limits as part of a natural, inherently reciprocal cosmological order. Contrary to Martin Jakes and Julie Binary definition of present day China, or I might say readings of Martin Jakes and Julie Binary definition of present day China as a civilization state rather than a modern nation state, a more precise observation might be that the PRC now shuttles in theory and practice between those two imaginaries as a matter of geopolitical expediency. On the one hand, Beijing defends the newly empowered PRC's national integrity against outside interference in line with concept conceptions of the modern nation state. On the other, there is an intellectual reprising of Tianxia as a natural, morally and aesthetically legitimized underpinning to the PRC's place within a newly configured post-West global order or disorder. Viewed from a deconstructivist standpoint, the inherent contradiction of Zhao's ostensibly cosmopolitan argument is all too clear. The historical significance of Tianxia leaves it inescapably marked by the traces of Chinese dynastic imperialism. Moreover, shuttling between nationalism and Tianxia in the present suspends any sense of China's territorial integrity totality somewhere and nowhere between the dual imaginaries of empire and the nation state. As the becoming space of an ultra-nationalist imperialist China in both the formal and informal senses of the prefix ultra as transcendent, going beyond those things, and are going to extremes. Both possibilities are, are there. How one reads China's potential trajectory as a renaissance geopolitical power and its revisiting of Tianxia is consequently a matter of parallaxic discursive positioning. Either way, it has become necessary to relinquish the assumed sovereignty of established post enlightenment modernist and supplementary post modernist viewpoints and recognize in their stead an emerging state of contemporaneity characterized by a materially tilted, multi dimensional, and multivalent global geopolitical realpolitik. I'm just going to I don't know whether everybody can see this. What I'm showing now is a, a relatively recent artwork by an artist called Fu Xiao Tong. And it's called um, 300,800 <laughs> Pinpricks. It was made in 2015. And uh, I the think work actually, is. The screen sharing has stopped again. So if you restart it, maybe we'll be able to see it. Sorry. Okay. No, no, well, let's try that. Okay, let's have another go. How does that look? Uh, I can't see anything. Uh, Ping has said she'll be able to share the presentation as a file after the talk with the attendees, so I, I guess we'll have to do that. Okay, I'll use a bit of ekphrasis then and just describe this invisible work, which is in a certain sense appropriate, actually. But yes, please do share it afterwards. 
What I'm showing is an artwork by Fisher Tong. And um, it's an image of a mountain landscape. Um, fairly realistic, almost like an illustration in some ways of an actual mountainside. And the image is made not by adding something to a material support. It's not ink and paint on, on paper or canvas or silk or whatever. It's actually a piece of Schwann paper, which I'm sure the audience will know is the traditional paper, handmade paper used by, um, uh, as part of ink, brush, ink and brush painting and calligraphy in China for many, many hundreds of years. And what um, Xiao Tong uh, does is she uses needles, which are more usually uh, employed um, for embroidery, uh, to prick many, many thousands of holes, hence the title of the work. Um, and the relative density of the pin pricking, um, pushing holes through the paper, actually creates the image. Um, both in reproduction and in, and in you know, first-hand observation, one has a sense of a picturing of a, a mountain, but there's nothing being added to the paper. In fact, it's, a, it's simply the taking away or the perforation of the paper that creates disruptions in the surface that allow the light to be reflected in different ways from the surface in order to make the image. So in a certain sense, this is connected to the great tradition of Chinese painting in that it shows mountainous landscape. It uses a traditional support, but the thing which is absented is the male principle of the ink. Now I could go into, into a sort of um, discussion of this as, as a invert, in inverted commas feminist work, but that's perhaps for another day. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, we have this work and I think one thing we might say about it is it, it might point us towards a partial answer of what might be a contemporary pictorial correlative of the emerging multidimensional and multivalent conditionality that, that I've just been describing, the, the, the idea of contemporaneity that I've been describing. What Fu is effectively doing is bringing together a clearly delineated topographical realism um, it's abstracted in a certain sense, but it, there is a, a sense of it being um, realistic, more so perhaps than um, traditional Chinese ink and brush painting. And a technical form or playing between absence and presence, the perforating of the surface to create the presence of the image, which is, is arguably redolent of Xu Xu, the traditional Chinese aesthetic of Xu Xu. This, I would suggest, indicates the possibility of an expansive remotivation of the material spiritual realm of Tianxia, whose meanings, as I've just been describing, can now be understood to resonate in multiple directions under currently shifting geopolitical circumstances, both toward and away from nationalist imperialist totality. Which direction the course of events will take, only time can tell. Thank you very much. I'm just very glad we got through that with a, a breakdown of sound at least. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a fascinating presentation. I, um, uh, we've had some uh, links in the chat to some of the work by Fu Xiaotong. So I think uh, we very much appreciated the ekphrastic ek account of it. And some people will also have been able to see um, some of the works that, uh, that uh, so related works that you were talking about. Um, so we now have plenty of time for uh, uh, questions and answers. There's both the um, Q and A function, or you are welcome to uh, write in the chat, and we will uh, uh, read the uh, questions for the speaker. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have a question in the question answer from Michael Patton. 
asking how does the concept shi fit into your argument, both in terms of the art and the present day politics? So do we mean by that in relation to shi shi, the shi and shi shi, is that, is that what we're talking about? It's the shi li, the shi, the power, strength. Oh, yeah. There's a, there's a bit of presence absence for you, um, present now. It's an interesting question. I, I, haven't, I actually haven't thought that through particularly in relation to this talk, but I suppose one, what one would say is that in picking out the particular concepts that I've highlighted here, I think everybody here will probably understand that this relates to a whole constellation of differing and related concepts. So this idea of a kind of virtuous network, of an aesthetic network, which is being evoked by, traditionally by Chinese painting, relates to a much broader constellation of concepts. I can't give you a kind of direct answer to, to that particular question, but I suspect I can broaden it a little bit and I'll certainly go away and think about it. But this whole idea of power, I think is an important one in the sense that, you know, epistemological or the force of epistemological uh, epistemology or the acceptance of epistemolo epistemology is not only based on the force of the argument or, or, the, or, the, or the persuasiveness of a particular truth being put forward, but also the kind of material forces that go with it. And one of the things that I'm drawing attention to here is that the shift towards contemporaneity and the, and the discursive shifts that go with it are in many ways materially empowered. I mean, for, for, many, for a number of centuries, westernized post-enlightenment discourses have, have held sway to some extent globally, enforced by economic and, and military colonialist imperialist Sorry about that. What we now have most certainly is a, a shift or a tilting of that power, which has been, which is one of the consequences of globalization. And instead of moving towards a, a, cosmo, a desired cosmopolitan state of some kind of shared world under neoliberalism, I think we've, we've, we've moved towards a highly connected world that is also, as we've seen from recent events all over the world, increasingly fractious, uh, involving significant discursive contestations. And one of the things that has in, empowered that contestation is tilting of power, economic, military, and, and discursive. Can you... Do I have another, Josh, do I have another question? Yes, yeah, sorry, I wasn't, I, I lost you for a while. I'm not sure whether that was my connection or yours. Um, yes, there is a, there's a question. Uh, from... I, I Um, I'll maybe turn my video off in the hopes that that'll improve the bandwidth. Um, we have a question from Ying Jie Guo asking, can you please say more about the boundary of Tianxia? Does Tianxia equals the globe? Thanks. Right, that's a really good question. Um, like any discursive construction, Tianxia doesn't have a, a single absolute in it. It can be read from different points of view. One way of thinking about it, I'm putting something together that might seem certainly illogical, but, but I think is the case, is that it's, it's a way of conjoining, or it's an index of conjunction of what we might say rather crudely is the kind of rationalized tendencies of Confucianism and the kind of support and qualification of Confucianism by 
people cause a lot of pain kind of index of the meeting things and, and what is what is suggested is effectively the body of the court Chinese court. We read it scientifically. Now we encountered that even in discussions about China about power of perhaps being stretched, mutilated the further you go out from Beijing. In the realm of Tianxia, um, imperial power radiates out concentrically. So even when we get to the borders, if you like the effective or the operative borders of imperial China, where the Great Wall is or the South, the Numbing Wall is, um, are ways of controlling keeping people out and allowing them in, um, that the imperial power is in, in principle, at least thought of as radiating beyond those imme that immediate pale, those immediate boundaries, but in sort of concentric levels of influence. It's a, it's a global authority, which accepts that there are kind of, there's a hierarchical relation of limitations around that. Now in the, with the revisiting of Tianxia, that, that's a different reading, if you like. Um, modern scholars in China who've, who've, who've put this forward as a, as a basis for a new world order are really saying something more along the lines of, you know, live and let live, non-interference between societies, everybody should get along, and there should be a kind of harmony rather than competition between states. It's, it's, it's kind of a version of cosmopolitanism if you will, but it's being called Tianxia. The problem being, as I, I guess I'm alluding to here, is you can't rid the term of its historical meanings, its historical relationships. So one is able to claim something, but it doesn't necessarily have absolute authority. One might compare this, say, with European imperialism, which may have thought to an extent a kind of concentric order, but it's actually radiating out from post-Westphalian nation states that feel that they can impose their authority on other parts of the world. Tianxia doesn't quite have the same meaning, although in practice it might. In principle, no, in practice, yes. So I think what we're looking at here is not a single definition of what Tianxia might be or to what extent imperial authority applies, but differing readings over time and in different places as to what that might mean. Fascinating, yeah, that, that also makes me wonder whether it's sort of intended as, as an assuagement uh, term for you know, yes. those who might be spooked by contemporary uh, rise in Chinese power. I think, um, I think actually I'll, I'll answer that because I think that's a really very good point. It, I think it can be read as assuagement, but it might not be intended as such by the scholars involved. They may quite well mean it in, a, in, a, um, in good faith as, a, as what they perceive as a better basis for a new post-West world order. But of course, it's double edged or multiply edged. I mean, I think one of the light motifs that I would see as running through all of this is that nothing here is open to a, a single defining perspective, interpretive perspective. Mm, fascinating. Uh, we have a question from Qin Yang, uh, who thanks you for the talk and asks Could you explain a bit more about how Confucian values translate into an aesthetic? Yes. I'll, can I start with? Let me start with a, a post-Enlightenment European or Euro-American perspective. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, from the end of the 18th century, with the emergence of philosophical aesthetics in, in, in European and Euro-American contexts, there's effectively a, a separation is made between the aesthetic, not only within as a philosophical subject from other philosophical subjects, but also between aesthetics and society. 
uh, a principle is established and it, uh, around the development of the idea of the sublime, that the aesthetic can be a, a site or a locus of distinction from or critical resistance to society. That this is a standard trope of progressive Western thinking about art and aesthetics, even, not just under modernity, which would tend to rationalize that distinction, but also post-modernity, deconstructive postmodernism, as uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard points out, is in a certain sense a remotivation of the sublime in that direction. And even when you, you have a you know, fairly ingrained postmodernist view that, 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 radic that, that um, categorical distinctions between anything can no longer be upheld, there is a tendency, certainly institutionally within art worlds, westernized art worlds, to maintain this idea of a critical separation between the aesthetic and society. One, one simply has to read blurbs for the Sydney Biennial or any other biennial or lots of stuff supporting the, the credibility of artists churned out by galleries and museums to see that. It's, a, it's still there, regardless of the interventions of deconstructivist postmodernism. So to return to the question, the, the, the issue is that, as I would see it, is that Long before post-Enlightenment aesthetics in Europe, China had its own Confucian version of aesthetic resistance. Uh, I alluded to it very briefly, but it's possible to see all sorts of non-conformist, irrational artistic behavior in China, particularly among the literati, as signifying elusive forms of resistance to overweening authority. In that sense, the aesthetic is not detached categor categorically from authority, it is embodied in those people, that exclusively male group, as it happens, and aristocratic or aristocratically behaving group that is expected to engage in aesthetic activity. And that aesthetic activity is not simply a matter of entertainment or pleasure, although it's that as well, it's also wistful reflection, what we might term inaccurately as philosophical reflection, but also some kind of resistance, some kind of signification of resistance, either through withdrawal or a kind of oblique or elusive demurral from authority. This is not quite the same as the, certainly the modernist construction of a critical aesthetic in westernized context, the one that we tend to live with still live with now internationally. In China, it's codified differently. The codification in China is an acceptance that these things can't be pulled apart. And, and moreover, that governance, the aesthetic and the ethical are all reciprocally conjoined in some way. Now, as I've argued somewhere on several occasions, that might, might be the more insightful view of the relationship between society and the aesthetic than the one which has been conventionally upheld in westernized contexts. And it may be, maybe, that that historical Chinese insight is one that will become and is becoming more discursively assertive under the conditions of contemporaneity. I mean, of course, Western or westernized post-structuralism drew some kind of attention to this at the end of the 20th century, but the, the, the deconstructivist vision is one that constantly points away from totality, from the metaphysical. The interesting thing about Taoist inflected Confucian uncertainty is that it points towards harmony, or at least it's perceived to do so. So we perhaps have an alternative vision of the relation, relationship between society and the aesthetic that does not involve the kinds of ideas of critical distancing that have become embedded in westernized art world contexts. Wonderful, thank you. We have a, we have a question from uh, Xiao Huan Zhao from 
Uh, asking about uh, uh, Tianxia is often discussed in association with Da Tong, Great Harmony Unity. Yes. And uh, Da Tong, Great Unification. Yes. Uh, in Chinese discourses. Can you please talk about the relationship between them? I think it's a very important point. I mean, I, I've alluded to that in the talk, but it's great to bring the, that particular term in, into play. Right, we, we, have a, we have a historical and a more contemporary context for those things. Historically in China, that idea of great unity, of course, is the empire. And the empire is, is constructed on the basis of a desired harmony between humanity and heaven. And that's not meant to be partial. It's not meant to be exceptionalist in the sense that it applies to part of the earth and not other parts of the earth. It's meant to be totalizing. So the Chinese imperial state, although it's minding its own business within certain bounds, the imperial state is also notionally extensive and it is seeking that greater totality in a not only a global context, but also a cosmological context. It's the traces of those ideas, which I think that we might see as pertaining to present day circumstances. Um, now, of course, one doesn't have to buy into this as a metaphysical truth. Let's maintain a certain oblique skepticism in relation to this. But I think one can see the traces of these ideas in the growing empowerment of the Chinese, modern Chinese state. I think, as, I think as the argument goes that, you know, China does not wish to be a world, a global world power in the American sense or the British sense or the European sense, a colonialist imperialist power in that way. Nevertheless, embedded within Tianxia and ideas of a greater unity is, a, is another kind of imperialism. And I think that's probably where we are in terms of this tilting of power now. What I'm not doing necessarily is kind of raising some, you know, uh, scare figure. Say, so, oh, look out, here comes a frightening imperial China. But I think it's important to note that these things do have a confluence in, in contemporary politics. And that because of the kind of forceful shifts, going back to an earlier question, going back to these shifts in force, I think this is one of the key things that we all, I mean, everyone in China, outside of China, will have to engage with in the coming decades. And I suspect, and we, we've all, we all watch the, the media, westernized media, and see something a little bit more rationalized or categorical in terms of an interpretation of what China's doing. I think this more nuanced version is a more insightful way of thinking about the way that China might behave. And that doesn't mean necessarily China asserting itself in an imperialistic way, although it might, but it might actually assert itself in a way which attends to the contradictions that I've described within those traditional relationships between Tianxia and a greater worldly and metaphysical unity. Well, I wonder if I might uh, ask a question. Please do. Um, I've, you know, the, it, it's sort of a question across various disciplines and objects of study, how this has been achieved this you know, reclamation of classical Chinese vocabulary and references mm -hmm. and practices after you know, a rejection of them that is perhaps the most, you know, one of the most absolute in, in world history, you might, you know, like the, the, mm -hmm. so um, wh what do you think enables it? I mean, what, what, what has made that uh, available? Um, to reclaim something like, like, I mean, obviously it's a bigger question than just Tianxia. <laughs> yes. um, but <laughs> I, I, I was wondering whether you had any thoughts in, in that direction about how, you know, how we come to be here again, talking once again about classical China after mm. yeah. um, a rejection of it. I mean, the, yeah, I mean, we're we are talking about one of the greatest rejections during the second, uh, well, from the 1960s, maybe even from the 50s 
onwards within China of its classical past as a basis for a new society. Two things, the, the traces of that classical society are pretty stubborn. I mean, they, they could never go away entirely. You couldn't expunge them. It's like you can't expunge these traces easily from any society. You can't create an absolute ground zero. There will always be something resonant within the society, whether it's through literature, painting, memory, as long as you've got people alive who bridge these changes. You know, like musicians, musicians in China who were trained in, in classical musicianship, who happened to live through all of the years of the, the revolutionary period, but who were then able to record their music and pass on their knowledge, same with painters. You know, it depends on historical circumstances, but it's not easy to get rid of the traces of those things. I think the second thing to say is none of, none of this stuff in any society is simply transferred intact from one time to another, from one space to another. You know, there are always issues of temporal and cultural translation, which involve diffractions of meaning. So when we talk about classical tradition now and how it relates to contemporary time, we're not talking about some thing which has been retrieved in a pristine form from the past. It, it has inevitably been altered through translation. And of course, that's, that's the history of any habit, cultural habitus or attendant discourses. You know, China is not an unchanging discursive landscape or, you know, its habitus is not absolute and unchanging. It has changed radically. It's easier to see that, I suspect, from a position within China, if you're knowledgeable about those things, than it might be from outside. As Craig Kunis quite rightly points out, you know, a Western audience will tend to look at the Chinese painterly tradition and see the same thing. Whereas what we're looking at is a kind of very nuanced and constantly changing set of circumstances. And those changes, that kind of diffractive, those diffractive shifts in relation to changing circumstances, of course, embedded just as much within syncretic Confucian thinking as, and, and Taoist thought as they are within, let's say, a post-structuralist or deconstructive argument about, about, about the same things. So I guess we're saying two things is one is the traces are stubborn. The second is that it's not a straightforward translation. It's an adaptation of those traces to, to, to present circumstances. And those adaptations will continue to go on. They, they went on in terms of Imperial China's relationship to, to, to other states within East Asia, so Japan, you know, China's classical traditions were translated into Japan, but in different forms, same, in, same thing in Korea in, in different forms, although they're recognizably connected. I guess the, the, the other point to make is that one has to say, well, why? why? Why have these things come back? Why didn't China just burn the ground, burn the house down and you know, maintain a, a, a socialist modernity without tradition? Well, as I alluded to very briefly, of course, there's a reason for this, or I, perhaps many reasons for this, but one reason is that finding a certain social cohesiveness in a rallying round comforting tradition is politically expedient. And, and as we all know, there were significant debates in China during the 1990s, even before that, but certainly in the 1990s, about the extent to which, well, one could go right back to the 19th century, of course, but in the 1990s, you know, the extent to which a westernized modernity should be absorbed, the extent to which it's important to protect against the deracinating effects of that, maintaining a specific Chinese identity, and even an exceptionalist Chinese identity, which, which is the basis for what might be seen as Chinese civilization. So there's a certain expediency, political expediency in doing that. Um, I, I guess those of us who've been in China in the past few decades will know, it's on the street. One just has to see government posters exhorting the population towards a more harmonious society to see certain traces of, of those Confucian aspirations, albeit ones that are no longer necessarily tied in great detail to Confucian thought. But of course, scholars in China will tell you something different. I mean, uh, no end of people, whether than scholarly community or, or at its 
periphery as a recent conference that I just did on the exhibiting of Chinese art um, will be aware, anybody who came along to that, you know, that there are now, there is now a desire to re, remind that tradition in all sorts of areas of, of Chinese culture and society. We have a question from Yu Xinjiang. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm wondering if you elaborate a little more about the ways contemporary modes of artistic expression align to or deviate from the Tianxia visions of the ancient imperial court or those of the literati or aristocrats in classical mm. Chinese culture. It's a great, great point. Actually, having said that the conf that Confucian liter literati tradition tended to see a reciprocity between the aesthetic, the ethical, and governmental administration. What we have witnessed, particularly since the end of the 1970s or the mid 1980s, is a, a partial absorbing in mainland China. And we must make some distinctions here between mainland China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, and Chinese diasporas, which you know, all of them are following sort of different discursive trajectories, certainly over the past half century or so, or century. But in mainland China, what the mid eighties saw is the absorbing of certain westernized ideas of artistic autonomy. Now, I think that was partly something that was desired by artists in China as a way of carving out some kind of distance between their work and the, the, the relation and the close relationship between socialist realism and dominant ideology in China during the revolutionary period. It's a way of kind of setting oneself apart from that. At the same time, and of course this, this sounds quite Confucian when I say it, at the same time, those artists were constantly knocking on the door throughout the eighties into the nineties, right through the 90s, in many cases, saying to government, can we discuss our place in this changing society? And the development of, you know, art markets, different kinds of, different kinds of professional structures and government structures around art in China during that period, show a certain adaptation to that, that second desire. Of course, since Xi Jinping came to power, something's changed insofar as Xi Jinping has reinforced the spirit uh, and in a sense, the letter of the directives handed down in 1949, that art should serve the, the strategic purposes of, of, of the party and represent the, the, reflect the view of the mass of people. That directive never went away. It might have seemed that it went, had gone away during the 1980s with the establishment of recognizably contemporary art in China, but it never did go away. What did happen from the 1980s is an accommodation between government and, and art and the art world, the Chinese art world, which enabled artists to do what they wanted as long as they didn't cross that boundary. And of course the boundary wasn't explicitly uh, uh, um, identified. It was a vague directive in the 80s and artists became self-surveying in, in that respect. But since 2012, 2013, Xi Jinping has obviously given cultural bodies in, in, in China a, a talking to and a kind of restatement of those principles under modern conditions. If you're living under those conditions, Opposing authority is problematic. You know, one only has to look towards the example of Wei 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 to see what the potential consequences of an open opposition to authority might be. Most artists, most artists I know who are hugely clever, critical people also know how to sustain their practice. And it's not through direct opposition. Does that sound familiar? Of course it does. However, it would probably be too much of a stretch simply to say that 
contemporary artists in China are Confucianists. It's too big a claim. Things have changed. They're no longer absolutely embedded in governments. They are an adjunct to governments. But there's still a close reciprocity enforced by power. Um, so, as you, so as not to kind of give the wrong idea or the wrong impression, one can turn this on its head and look at Western societies. Um, the, the demands of Western societies for artists to conform to dominant discourses are not so obvious. But of course, artists are totally embedded, most of them, in the demands of a capitalist society. It's exactly it's surplus value from, the, from capitalist societies, which generates the possibility of an art world. Um, you know, I've often had this debate with artists and others outside of China about, oh no, art, you know, art internationally is critically autonomous, and no, it isn't. <laughs> I think, I think the Confucian view or the, or the historical Chinese view is more accurate, is that the aesthetic is implicated hugely in authority. It might still resist it, but it can't detach itself. There is no virtuous detachment to be found. I think that's, if you like, different and certainly in China, one can perceive the persistent traces of a, I would argue, of a, a certain Confucian habitus, which allows artists to adopt a progressive critical position in relation to society. Wonderful. Um, I think that is about all the time we have uh, for today's session. So I think I speak on behalf of all the attendees when I say uh, thank you very much for uh, the fascinating presentation and the uh, question and answer session. Um, and uh, I wish everybody a very good day. Thank you, Professor. Thanks for, the, thanks for the questions. I think they were great questions, really good. And um, uh, Ping will be able to send the slides through to all the attendees. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll drop that over through retransfer sometime late, uh, first thing tomorrow. But thank you again. It's great. Wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us. And thanks, thanks, for, all thanks the for inviting me. Speak to you soon.